I don't fully understand why. For us, right? I think, I have no idea. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't he sacrifice himself or something like that? Well, they're not like me. They're so churchy, I'm sorry. <laughs> Christians believe that he died for their sins. I don't know. Like, I really, I don't know the answer to that. Jesus died so that I could be free. For me, because he knew that I needed some help, so he did it for me. Persecution against him. He died for his beliefs, which is pretty anarchist of him. Because a lot of the stuff he taught was contradictory to Roman philosophy, ideology at the time. Because of the same thing that's going on now, jealousy and bad mindedness and people just fear. For our sins, he got betrayed by Judas to give us right relationship with God. He brought to light a lot of things that needed to be brought to light. And he created this movement around, you know, being a genuine good person, you know, and I love that. The story is that he died for his people or something like that, um, for love. Even though I'm not necessarily Christian, I still look up to Jesus because, come on, he's an amazing person. How could he be so selfless, you know? That's what I want to strive to be. Mornings, a lot happening. There's a lot happening at CCF. There's a lot happening th this morning. Um, scrambling a lot this morning to make sure everything's set in the kids' hub, to make sure that um, we run smoothly. Um, um, so, what are our children and youth doing? I always want to start with that when I come before you. Our, our children are continuing to, to uh, walk through the Gospel Project curriculum. As uh, today, they actually learned about uh, King Solomon. Um, our middle school students are continuing to uh, read through the book of Romans, while our high school students have begun um, learning about the gospel according to Luke. Um, and they're actually been taking turns teaching on, on, on a chapter every Friday that they meet together. Um, so first, a great way to introduce new information to someone is to ask questions. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the um, Socratic method, developed by a man named Socrates, a Greek philosopher who lived hundreds of years before Jesus. Um, uh, Peter Connor of Colorado State University writes this at this, Socratic method, method is a dialogue between teacher and students instigated by the continual probing questions of the teacher in a concerted effort to explore the underlying beliefs that shape the students' views and opinions. All right, so if there may be some of you in this room that, that grew up Catholic that may be familiar with uh, going through first and second catechism. And catechism is a medieval term for a question and answer format. So asking questions to a group is a great way to engage that group and get them to start conversations. Uh, if the media team has these pictures, I'm going to ask them to put them up. I'm not sure if they do. Um, but uh, about four years ago, around this time, we all know that that was 2020. Um, in, in January of 2020, I, I helped uh, begin a ministry called Peacemakers. And uh, I partnered with the local church, this was before I knew of, C of CCF. And we met every other week, every, every other Saturday, in the Latin American Youth Center in Riverdale, Maryland, right next to William Wirt Middle School. And uh, these were kids that I had built relationships with in my neighborhood for four years at this point. So we would have food, we, we would play games, and then we would come together and start our own, uh, and start a Bible study. We would, but we would start the Bible study with a question. Then that question would lead to more questions that would expand the discussion for the day. And we, we would start with questions like, well, who is Jesus? We got to around Valentine's Day, of course we asked the question, what is love? You know, what is justice? What is the purpose in your life? And if you want to have a great conversation with a group of teenagers, all you need to do is start with a question. Listen to them answer that question, and then ask them more questions about the language that they use to answer that question. You'll be there for a long time. So questions are a great way to engage a classroom, to engage youth. Questions are a great way to start conversations. Questions are a great way to engage non-believers. Asking questions is a, great, is a great way to see not only what people believe, but why they believe it. And questions are also a great way for a believer to test what they know and maybe even discover what you don't know. 
Now, why did Jesus die? Let's review some of the answers we heard and, and let's examine them. We heard someone say, so that I can be free. Uh, Jesus died for his beliefs. We heard a woman say that Jesus died for me. Someone said that he died to have a, a right relationship with God. I think we would all agree with that. Jesus died because he preached a message in contrast to Roman philosophy. Jesus died because people were jealous. Jesus died because he was betrayed by Judas. Did Jesus die for love? Jesus died because he wanted to start a movement of genuine goodness. These are some interesting answers. But let's look at the scriptures and see what they have to say. The 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 reads, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be equipped for every good work. So even though our primary purpose with Alpha is to bring people in and, and allow them to ask questions and answer questions, um, you know, we can't be afraid to tell people that some of their answers may be wrong or may be half right, right? Um, but we, because, because we as Christians, we believe that we measure our answers through the Word of God as a canon of Scripture. Now, church, if we question if the Scriptures are reliable and how, how do we know that we can rely on them, well, I would just have to tell you that you have to go back and watch a few sermons ago when I was in front, in front of you, all right? We talked about how the Scriptures were reliable. So now let's look at the Old Testament. Let's look at the prophet Isaiah. And why Isaiah? Well, Jesus, when he's in the synagogue, we just, you know, went through this with our high school students a few weeks ago, going through the Gospel of Luke. He reads a prophecy from the book of Isaiah. And before he sits down, he says that the prophecy had been fulfilled. Jesus claims that Isaiah, along with the other prophets in the scriptures, along with Moses, spoke about him and were foretelling or prophesying about him years before his coming. Well, Isaiah 53, 4 through 6 reads, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. If we keep reading in Isaiah, we go down to verse 10 and verse 11, we read, Yes, it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his land. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. So let's examine what the prophet Isaiah says. Well, the prophet Isaiah is saying that this individual was considered punished by God, and this was no accident. It was God's will to crush him. He suffered. He was pierced for our transgressions. This is where we get the idea of this substitutionary penal atonement that Jesus didn't just die for us, but he died and suffered in place of us. He was punished for a crime or crimes that he was innocent of. So why did Jesus die? So when we ask this question, our, our mind can go to a few different places, and I think that's, that's the same for the people who answered this question. Number one, we ask the question, why did Jesus die? Um, some of us may be thinking, you know, what series of events led people to kill Jesus? But then some of us may be thinking, okay, well, what was God's plan in the death of his one and only son? So his word says that his ways are higher than our ways, and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And just like in Joseph's story in Genesis 50, verse 20, what people intended for evil, God meant for good, to bring about that many should be kept alive. Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery because they hated him, but God allowed it to happen because he loved them. You see, Joseph was sold into slavery to set, to set in motion a series of events that would eventually save his own family that, sent, that sold him into slavery. There are many 
who had their own agendas in murdering Jesus, their own plans, but God's plan was for our salvation. So let's take a look at the reasons why people in this moment in history wanted Jesus dead. Number one, Jesus told the people that they would not accept a prophet in their own town. In Luke 4, Jesus says, they got up, well, they got up and drove him out of the town and took him uh, to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went his own way. See, it's important for us to understand that a lot of the, the testaments that we see in the old prophets were not accepted well by the people. In fact, a lot of those prophets were actually killed. And so Jesus was placing himself among that class of prophets that, that spoke about um, God's wrath against the people and, and warned people to turn away from their wicked ways. Number two, Jesus claimed to have authority over the Sabbath. Now, we know the significance of the Sabbath. We know that, um, according to Genesis, the Lord rests on the seventh day. And then in Exodus, he, he commands the Israelites to keep the Sabbath day holy. And so something happens in Luke chapter 6. Jesus and his disciples were hungry. They have been traveling. And so Jesus compares. And so what, what happens is they, they end up picking grain to make food on the Sabbath because they're hungry, which is, which is against Sabbath law. But Jesus compares this story to what happens with David and David's men. When David's men were, were fleeing from Saul, they go and they eat the bread that was consecrated, that was only for the priests. But, but they were allowed to do it because they were hungry, and, and the Lord allowed David to eat the bread. So Jesus was saying that he is a greater David. Now Jesus also heals on the Sabbath. And he explains to the Pharisees, that if you are keeping a law on the Sabbath that results in not loving and not showing compassion to your neighbor, you are actually not keeping the law. Because if, if to fulfill the law is to love your neighbor as yourself, then you are not really keeping the law if you neglect that part of the law. So Jesus claimed to have authority over the Sabbath. Number three, people wanted to kill Jesus because Jesus claimed to be equal to God. John chapter 5, so because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him in defense. Jesus said to them, my father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For, his, for this reason, they tried all the more to kill him, not only because he was breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. John 5, 16 through 18. Now, number four, Jesus was feared to be a threat to Jewish society and Roman authority. John 11 and John 19 tell us this story. John 11, 45 reads, Therefore many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them that Jesus, what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting on the of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Then one of them, named Caiaphas, who was a high priest that year, spoke up. He says, you know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for, for you that one man die for the people than that that, that whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. And not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God, to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. So it is true that the Jewish leaders, even though they were actively oppressing their own people, were worried that if the Romans saw Jesus as a threat, they would come and destroy them. Then later, we see them actually pressuring Pontius Pilate on this same point in John 19. When, when Pilate heard this, he, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement. It was, that, it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away. 
Take him away. Crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar. The chief priest answered, finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. So you see, politics did have a role to play in the plots of men. Jesus did disrupt their political system, but he continually told them that his kingdom was not of this world. So why did Jesus say he needed to die? What did Jesus himself have to say about his death? Number one, he says to give his life as a ransom for many. Just as a son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, Jesus says in Matthew 20, verse 28. A ransom to, to buy something or to repurchase something back. Number two, to be raised from the dead. And he said, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. Luke 9, 22. Number three, Jesus says that he died to give eternal life. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Now, let's look at someone's someone else's testimony about why Jesus died. Let's look at a skeptic in the scriptures by the name of Paul. Most of us know his story. He was someone who thought he was serving the Lord by persecuting Christians. He was a skeptic. He was a first century Jew. Right, so someone whose life was completely changed by seeing the risen Jesus. And as a Jewish Pharisee, he realized the magnitude of Christ's death and resurrection. So Paul says that Jesus died for the wages that we owed. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Romans 6, verse 23. In accordance with the Levitical law, blood must be shed for the atonement of sins. And Jesus paid that debt with his life. But he was sinless. Number two, Jesus died so that we may become the righteousness of God so that we may be righteous before God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that we may become the righteousness of God, 2 Corinthians 5, 21 tells us. See, in order for us to stand in the presence of a righteous and holy God and dwell in his temple, we must be made righteous. So Christ clothes us in his righteousness. Jesus is able to do this because he knew no sin. Number three, Jesus died for his love for us in spite of us. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8. So let's go back and examine those first questions and, and those first answers that we heard of just a few minutes ago. Did Jesus die so that we can be free? Well, yes, so that we can be free from the chains of sin, Romans 6, verse 20. Did Jesus die for his beliefs? Yes, because he believed to be God. He believed he was God and that you must believe that. John 8, verse 24. Did Jesus die for me? Yes, only if you have placed your faith in him and him alone. John 14, verse 6. Did Jesus die because he preached a message in contrast to Roman philosophy? Well, yes. But not only because he was in contrast to Roman philosophy in that time, but to every philosophy that presents itself, past, present, and future, that sets itself up against the very knowledge of God. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 4. Did Jesus die because people were jealous? Yes, but not just jealous, but because people are sinners who are in need of a Savior. Romans 3 verse 23. He was betrayed. Yes, but not only by Judas but by every single one of us every single day. Did Jesus die for love? Yes, but not because of our love for him, but because of his love for us, because he loved us first, 1 John 4, 19. Did Jesus die because he wanted to start a movement of genuine goodness? 
No, because he was the only one who was good. No one is righteous, not even one. Romans 3, verse 10. But once he was saved, we are saved not by works, but to do good works. Ephesians 2, verse 10. Jesus died to satisfy the wrath of God so that we may become children of God, so that we can have the privilege to be adopted into his family. That is why Jesus died. For God so loved the world. We hear this verse so many times, but it tells us right here. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life, John 3, 16. Now, understanding why Jesus died, church family, what sort of implications does that have for us? Who are you going to tell? Who do you need to tell? How are you going to live? Jesus' death and his resurrection is proclaimed by us every time that we gather together. But this should not be the only time that we have conversations about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection and why he died. We have an opportunity to tell our neighbors, our family members, our friends, or the people in our workplace who do not know Jesus, who have rejected Jesus, and tell them why Jesus died. Show them that we are sinners, that we have all fallen short of his glory. Not just me, not just you, but all of us. We've all fallen short. And the pain and suffering and the hatred and anger that we see in this world is all a result of our sin, of our willingness to, to disobey God, to turn away from him, to rebel against him. But he showed us his love while we were still sinners. So what, what are we going to do about that? Tell our neighbor, tell our family members, tell our friends, disciple our children in that truth. Dearly Father God, we thank you for this day, God. We thank you for all the reasons that you sent your son to die for us. God, help us remember how important it is to understand your sacrifice and why you died to save us from the wrath of God that we deserved so that we can be your children, to live with you for eternity, to live with you forever. Let us never lose how powerful that is, how powerful the message of the gospel is. Allow us to take it to the very ends of the earth. In your name we pray, amen.